most of us in here have actually been here from the morning and we've, we've, we've heard about some of the work that these guys are doing. Um, it's incredible stuff. Um, I've learned a lot about the countries that you guys come from, uh, the current affairs and, and how you guys are a massive players in that. So I think we all, we all know not to underestimate the role that journalists play, but obviously, you know, the industry has to adapt to uh, some of the new things that are coming up. Digital security is a massive part of that. So, I mean, the reason we're here today partly is because these amazing guys have been on a program. They are fellows of the digital security training. Uh, it's a program that is run by RSF Germany. So this is the bit where we talk a little bit about that program, some of the takeaways uh, that they've had. So that's what we'll be doing now. Um, and just a quick introduction. My name is Christine Mundo. I'm also a journalist. I'm based here in Berlin, and I work for the Deutsche Welle. And I know that some people came in um, a few seconds ago because I've been watching everybody. Um, so what I'll do is I'll just give you a quick introduction to who I have here uh, with me. We have Marie de Klerk. She is a journalist from Brazil. Uh, she works for Vice Brazil. She covers gender and youth issues. Um, and she's going to talk to us a little bit about some of the things that she's experienced. Um, she's been a victim of doxing um, uh, for after she reported on some far-right groups spreading hate um, on social media. I have Adnan Amir, who's from Pakistan. He covers politics, conflicts, and the economy. Um, his website's been subjected to hacking attacks, content that they've put up being removed because some people don't feel comfortable uh, with that content being up there. I have here Sophia Mapuranga from Zimbabwe. She's my home girl because I also happen to be uh, from Zimbabwe. Uh, she reports for one of the few remaining independent media um, houses in uh, Zimbabwe, and that is called ZimI. And Jonathan Dagger's over here. He's from Lebanon. He works for Megaphone, and that's an independent news platform, and that's available only on social media. So I'm going to start the clock now, guys, and I guess I want to pick up with you. Um, Adna, you've talked about uh, early on, you took us through some of the, the challenges you've had, yes. your website being hacked, content mm -hmm. being removed. Now, you said that coming into this program, you basically wanted to protect yourself from things like that. How did this program do that for you? What, what skills did you learn that you're actually using now, having finished this uh, program? So thank you, Christine. Thanks for having me. So yeah, you're right. Uh, before this program, like I consider myself to be technologically literate, but there are still some very basic things that I did not know about. For example, our website was uh, running on normal HTTP. Like we were not even using a like, transport encryption thing. And that was the reason we were hacked. It was so easy if you're not using a like a secure socket layer, it's so easy to hack into your website. So this is what we were victimized. And now that I know, the first, after doing this program, the first thing that I did was to get a secure socket layer to, to have a transport description. Now it was, now it's not that easy to hack into a website. And apart from that, uh, now like uh, I use a proton mail to send PGP encrypted emails, which are like not easy to encrypt, which is not possible to decrypt. And at the same time, we use signal, which is learned to, to communicate with our sources, to our friends, to, with, to with, also with our editors. So I think, so that's the, that's the one area where this training like equipped me and helped me in getting like, protecting myself in terms of like using encryption services. And firstly, like not only I knew about what these services are, and then I was able to use them and to implement them in my day-to-day -day work. Right, Mahi, I'll come to you here because one of the things that you mentioned when we had it offline is that a lot of people don't realize, a lot of journalists, that is, don't realize that this is something that they need. They're sort of, sort of oblivion to, to, to the threats that people face on the uh, digital platform. Talk to us about that and your experience with this program. Yeah, like before the program, like digital security for me was just about having a strong passport and passport and that was it. And I mean, lots of journalists are like this and actually mainstream journalists that do important things. Um, so I think the challenge was when I came back to Brazil was to say, you know what, we need to worry more about this because we are more and more vulnerable about. So this is something that really like uh, Brazilians, they don't know even the basic yet about digital security. It reminds me a lot when John said about the, the controversial journalists that they got their cell phone uh, stolen and she didn't have a lock. This is something that's really common uh, in Brazil, but I mean, we do Brazilians, we have a lock on our phones because our phones get stolen every time. <laughs> but, uh, but I mean, I think this is something that's starting to happen after Bolsonaro. Uh, 
because we don't know if we have government tracking, we don't know, uh, but we want to be less vulnerable right. right? because of that. Right. John, you mentioned something the other day when we were talking and you said that coming into this course you really just wanted to, you wanted to know more about this, you wanted to know how to protect yourself um, on the digital space and you talked about the fact that there was a lot of myth busting for you during the program, what were some of the things that you walked into this program thinking that actually were myth busted as you went through the program? Uh, I think the main thing was that uh, we're not powerless against this. We like uh, we we can. There are there are tools. Uh, with the, we're not facing some abstract uh, giant that is invincible. No, there are tools. Some of them are quite simple if we take the time to learn them and to know how to defend ourselves. And uh, there were other things where, like, I came in with many questions such as, can the government read my Facebook inbox messages, you know? Can they monitor my WhatsApp conversations? Uh, like, I, I didn't have an answer to these things. And when you don't have an answer, you tend to assume the worst. So there's another extreme where you live in a constant state of paranoia. Yeah. You know, like, oh my god, what are they doing? What can they do? And this program really helped assess who the opponents are, what their capabilities were, uh, what the risks were, and how to tackle every risk. It made the process, in my mind, way more scientific, uh, okay. if I can say that, and therefore it really, uh, I became more comfortable doing my work, knowing what kind of risk I was facing, even yeah. if I can't necessarily fight it. Yeah, it's just that knowing factor. So Sophia, you uh, mentioned when you gave your presentation that you, you're actually holding workshops with your colleagues back in Zimbabwe, you're teaching them some of the things that you learned here. Talk to us about how those workshops are going and, and what are you getting from your colleagues as you pass this information on? So basically after this training workshop, um, one of the key issues that I had to do, one of the key takeaways was that I had to relay this message back to my colleagues considering that we work as a team and so if I was capacitated as an individual and yet we work as a team, then it would defeat the whole purpose. So what happens is because of um, what I learned here, I related to my superiors to say, you know, digital security is very important for the whole team. And there was really that buy-in from my editors to say, yes, it's really critical that you, you know, relay this message to your colleagues. And we do hold those trainings, um, mostly on the weekends, because that's when we are a little bit less busy. There's not much diaries. And um, we come in as a team, we take one hour slots where we brainstorm, we work on what it is that we learned in the previous session. And we also do like a, a series to say we start with the threat modeling, then we learn how to do the secure passwords, we learn how to do the importance of the key passes, and we follow that route, right? Um, and then, I mean, in, in your case, it's a little bit different. Um, so Sophia has an audience. Um, she can she can pass this on. Is, is that the same uh, for you? Is it as easy to, to pass this on to, to some of your colleagues back home in Pakistan? Y yes, I think uh, yeah, because uh, at the moment there's a financial crisis in Pakistan and journalists are like, uh, like they are having really hard time. So it, it is like difficult to send, like to personally find time and convince a journalist to like, like provide this training one-on-one. -on -one. So I think uh, it would not be as easy, like is it, it's in Zimbabwe, it's, it's for me, but like I also try to teach this to my friend and to my close circle of friends. And uh, so that's why I think it, it would be more beneficial if like organizations like RSF or others in Pakistan, if they like conducted this training in like in a more organized way. Right. Mahi, just coming back to you, um, you know, when you talked about the, your experience in, in Brazil, having, you know, uh, been subjected to doxing, for those of you who don't know what doxing is, it's when people dig up information about you and then they, they publish it online, right? It, or to like defame you. Um, and you would go to the police and report this and the police would tell you, we can't do anything about it. Um, I got the sense that this, you're, you've been empowered by this program in a way. If you could maybe just elaborate on that. I mean, I think that what I learned about this program is that my, I think we can say enemies, my enemies, they are strong, but they are not able to do like everything they want. So if I can manage to like protect myself, so have uh, use apps that are tr tr reliable, uh, this would not happen, and I can keep 
monitoring them. So this was exactly happened when I did this training. So I learned how to use, uh, how to get in the dark net, which is quite simple. So I learned how to use Tor and how to be, how to navigate anon anonymously online. So I think that that's how this empowered me. So I came back and they kept, you know, sending me death threats, but it, it, I knew that they couldn't do anything because I was already really prepared. So I think that's that's how that's why you know, like I kept doing my job. It's really important to me. Right. I mean, I just want to point out the fact that I mean, we're not IT specialists here. Uh, none of us on the stage are. So I'm just thinking. So you walk into this program. It's about Sophia. Maybe pass this one on to you. Um, it's about digital security. It's about cyberspace. You're learning about hacking and all this stuff. Was this like intimidating content? Just how how was this made palatable for you? I mean. One, maybe you tried, you tried, did you fight hard to stay awake? I just want to say, was it a difficult thing to cook? I mean, it's just, I looked into the training room that they're at and all these like um, papers on the wall. It's all this technical stuff. And I thought, my goodness, I wouldn't make it through this course. It just looks so complicated. But talk to us about that content. How was it made accessible for you? And because it's obvious, I mean, she's not teaching other people what she learned. Yes, so basically the training content was such that it was actually tailor made to be palatable to somebody who's coming in a blank slate like me. When I came for the training workshop, I was totally clueless, which is something that I even mentioned when I applied for the scholarship to say, you know, digital security, I just know the steps and I don't know the technicalities of it. But then this training workshop was tailor-made to an extent that even a layman like me can now relay the message to others. It was done in such a way that it, it accommodates everyone, um, even somebody who knows from the basics to an extent that you come out of it with a clear understanding of all the processes, what happens, where, how, and how do you address this challenge. So the training workshop, um, when you even consider the content and how it um, was presented to us, when you want to look at the program to say, on the first day, this is what you do, and on the second day, it was so um, tailor-made to an extent that it was perfect for someone to come out very knowledgeable like me. Yeah, yes, she is living proof of that. <laughs> um, and I think, so there is obviously the element of, I think you're highlighting it's tailor-made because there are about four of you guys at a time doing the program. And actually, I'll just point out the fact that Adnan, Sophia, and John were we're in the same batch, uh, so to say. And I know that um, Nahi, you were one of the first uh, in terms of this program actually starting. So you're coming from different backgrounds, um, different sets of challenges, different expectations uh, from the program. So John, coming into this, how do you feel that that was all handled? Uh, well, I come from an engineering background, actually. So uh, I, some of the things that were discussed weren't very you know, foreign to me, but, but my engineering uh, training did not cover this at all. You know, it's just uh, I think it was a kind of logic that I I had I had had at, at some point. Uh, but in terms of digital security, I knew very little, um, or at least I found out how little I knew once I came here. Uh, I thought I knew a lot more, uh, and it was really like as as Sophia mentioned, it was really made uh, to the pace of uh, of every person who was there. And one thing that was nice is that. We were collaborating with each other, and training. The trainer was helping us. Then was helping us a lot. And one of the things that was part of the training was that we had to train each other as well. So every day we would have to start by one of us. Like really, we had to take shifts, and one person would come up and say, "Okay, this is what we learned yesterday, and I'm gonna quiz you." Or, or at the end of the day, you're gonna have to recap what happened, and we have to prepare ways to do that. And at some point, we even have to we have to give workshops to. Uh, University journalists, uh, students who, who came in, for example, like you. And, uh, yeah. Oh, they're waving. Hi, guys. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> yeah, so, so, like, I personally had to talk about VPNs and uh, Tor networks like five times in one day. Like, I had to repeat the hour five times. Like, at this point, you want to ask me anything you want about VPNs? <laughs> I'm going to explain it to you. And, and it's one of the things I remember the most in Lebanon, actually. Right. Actually, I want to pick up with you there because you, you, you went home to Lebanon and you, I mean, you tried to get an audience together to, to pass this on. Just tell us about that process. Yeah, that's a funny story actually because once again the revolution <laughs> kind of helped. Uh, like 
like I said, Megaphone is mostly volunteers working after hours, so one of the biggest challenges was um, trying to take this knowledge back because it wasn't going to be, there was, there was simply no time for it, you know, like gathering 30 people who are all volunteers with different schedules in one room and trying to share with them what I learned, even though they were very interested, which I came back and they were like, yeah, definitely, we have to do this. Uh, we just kept putting it off, and it's partly my fault too, because I kept getting swept by other things as, as well. And then the revolution happened. And people were talking about phones being stolen, and like things being taken, and hacks, and all this website got taken down. And it was a perfect opportunity, you know. We had, we had our monthly meeting, everyone was there, and we were like, okay, we, we're going to have an hour to talk about digital security measures. So I, of course, this was planned to be a day. I had to shorten it to an hour. Uh, but it was a very effective hour because by the end of it, we had shifted to Signal, first of all, even though there's still some resistance, people still like WhatsApp sometimes, <laughs> which is understandable, you know, it's, it's convenience over security. Uh, also one of the things you learned here. <laughs> security isn't always convenient, but you have right, to make a choice. Right, right. Uh, so we shifted to Signal, at least now we have this backup, and uh, we, everyone was installing two-factor authentication after, after this talk. Uh, we were changing passwords, you know, basic things, but it was important. And I think the importance kind of got chopped in our face once we were there. And, and it was the perfect timing for the course, if you think about it. Like, I'm, I'm so glad I wasn't chosen to be in during this time because I would be missing out on the revolution. And I wouldn't have had the training, but I, was, I took it just before the revolution. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was really... Uh, <laughs> it all came continue. together there. It all yeah. came together there. And I'm just coming back to you. I mean, you you sort of laid it all out for us in terms of the situation in Pakistan right now. But just, I mean, for the benefit of those who might have just jumped along now, um, why this this is so uh, pertinent in Pakistan right now, digital security and its awareness, especially among journalists. Yeah, like before I go to there, like I also wanted to add to the last question that you asked, that not only during our program, not only we learned about digital security, but we also got to know each other and our countries and everything. Like I had no idea what was happening in Zimbabwe or in Lebanon and everything. And especially like John told us so much about Lebanon. Now I consider myself to be an expert on Lebanon. And I, I, I always like joke about it, but it was like a very good experience to have. And it was not possible without getting in touch with these guys through this program. Now coming to your question about why we need it in Pakistan. So as I said in my presentation earlier, we have like 35% uh, of people in Pakistan have access to mobile internet and smartphones and so the internet penetration is like, like, is like very high. And at the, presently the journalism, the dynamics of journalism are so shifting more to digital world from electronic and print. So there are more and more journalists, more and more people are now getting, they are dependent on uh, the use of digital mediums, digital communications to, pre to report. And at the same time, the government is also trying to suppress them and to control them. The, like government is planning to, uh, to install the web monitoring system and everything. So with the passage of time, it is like, it is like every journalist has to like uh, protect themselves from not only from digital threats, but uh, the threats can be from everybody. It can be from government, it can be a political party, and it can also be from a fellow rival journalist who is just jealous. So you don't know. So you have to like protect yourself in all way you can. And the digital security is just the basics, just a basic point to start. So I think that's, that's the reason that we journalists in Pakistan, all of us need to know more about these things. Right. Maki, I'll come back to you here because I still have a question about, I mean, what threats do you, do you still face? Um, you've been back for a while now. I mean, you're, you're in the first batch, so to say. Um, what threats do you still face? I mean, I still cover far-right far movement, which involves basically supporters of Bolsonaro. There are, like, many kinds. So, yeah, like, sometimes I have some online trolls that still, like, reply on Twitter saying bad things about me. But, I mean, I think they, are, they were a little bit intimidated after, I mean, the massacre of what happened, like, the answer of the traditional media, because they were all over them, these online hate groups. But occasionally, I get, like, some emails saying, hey, remember us, we are here, we still remember you, because I think that uh, once you became a kind of an enemy, a supposed enemy of these groups, you became kind of this character, you know? You just became this, this person that exists on the internet and they just keep sometimes bothering you, sending emails, but I don't know, I don't think it's nothing serious now, but 
yeah, I, need, I still need to be careful, so something like this. And, and Sophia, perhaps maybe elaborate in terms of your platform, uh, ZimEye, and why this training is so important to the, to the extent that your management carved out the time for you guys to be able to, for you to be able to hold the workshops that you're having. You're also doing it with the freelancers um, in Zimbabwe as well. Yes, so basically because we are an online platform, the management really identified the importance of the training workshops because of the shift and they also realized like the digital threats um, that exist in my country. And also because they're really on the ground, there's really nothing that um, is going on with regards to training journalists on like the digital sphere. You find that even, you know, the recent graduates in journalism school, they really are not embracing digital security training as part of their curricula. So because our media house is basically more of online, they have identified the importance to say, well, she has learned on digital security from RSF, and she is willing to really tell that information to her colleagues at obviously no costs, and this is really beneficial to the organization. And the buy-in from the other journalists because of the daily threats that we you know, experience in the country, they've also realized the importance of you know, getting that information, the information that I've acquired from this training. John, perhaps talk to us about Lebanon and how you envision you could pass on some of the things that you that you learned here, just going forward. I mean, you talked about the initial sessions that you guys had with your colleagues, but taking that broader, perhaps. When we started developing a digital security protocol, I started working on it while I was here uh, under the guidance of RSF, and I'm taking it, like, I already took it back to Lebanon, and uh, there's my colleague, Dara Azza, who was quoted in my presentation. She's also uh, an expert on digital security, because she used to work with SMEX. Uh, she was alone, no one used to listen to her in meetings because she would be like, this is important, and everyone would be like, yeah, we'll get to it later. So I went back and I was like, listen, Atta, we need to make this happen. Uh, and now we're both like kind of spearheading this. And uh, the initial plan was to make it not just tailored to Megaphone, but also to other organizations such as Mada Masr, for example, and other uh, organizations in the Arab world. Uh, and like one of the things that happened, for example, when I came back is uh, a group of Women journalists from Syria contacted Megaphone. They wanted uh, they wanted a workshop on content creation tailored for social media, uh, and they deal with gender and sexuality issues, which are kind of taboo topics in Syria. So uh, Megaphone was like, "Can you speak to Can you speak to them? And can you see how you can how we can build this course to help them?" It was supposed to be a three day course, and then I suggested like digital security as part of this course, and they were like, "Yeah, we're just we're just basically looking at content creation." And I'm like, "Okay, but what do you do for digital security?" I mean. You guys are working from Syria, uh, one of the most dangerous places for journalists right now. And they were like, no, why is it dangerous? Like, it's fine, we're just putting things on Instagram. And it goes to show how little people can, are able to, or have the tools to assess the risks of operating online. And it, all it took was a 10 minute talk to convince them to add an entire day to the, to the thing, a day of digital security, basically, and all the things that we, that we could discuss and we could talk about. Unfortunately, this never happened because a week later the revolution started and it became impossible for them to come to Lebanon. But, uh, but it's definitely in the back of my mind, you know, whenever it happens, I really believe that this should be spread, uh, this knowledge should be spread, just like I took it, you know, uh, I took it very generously from RSF, and I should be giving it as generously as I can to as many, not just journalists, but also people, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the news business, I mean, we, I guess the world over, Financing is, is, is a big situation. Um, there's not a whole bunch of money in a lot of newsrooms, um, especially for something like this. And I guess in a lot of places, this becomes a luxury in a way, but it isn't, uh, Mahi. Um, just talk to us about your sense about how practically this kind of thing could be rolled out in newsrooms in Brazil, if, you, if, you, if you've had time to reflect on that. Most traditional uh, newsrooms, uh, uh, mainstream media, they are uh, like, they are concerned about how they can protect themselves. And this changed a lot on 2000, after 2013 when we had demonstrations in Brazil where lots of uh, cell phones and smartphones were seized by the police. 
So this change uh, for traditional newsrooms, and also I think independent media also is really concerned about that. But I think in Brazil, there's something really uh, important to know about digital security that people know very little about it. So we are the top five countries that are really connected online. Like everybody has a smartphone, everybody can reach, uh, has social media, but nobody knows what is internet, for example, how the internet works, what is deep web, for example. So people use that, uh, this misinformation about internet, to attack, for example, the left, the left wing. So I just want to say this example because uh, this I wrote an article after I did my training, like uh, doing this mystifying this notion about darknet, about deep web or darknet, uh, because uh, this year happened like some message in Telegram of our actual uh, Ministry of Justice, Sergio Moro, was leaked by um, by the Intercept by Glenn Greenwald. So it was like some message that he was sh exchanging with the prosecutors of the Operation Car Wash, which is, uh, is the biggest operation against corruption in Brazil. And this message, uh, uh, Sergio Moro, our, our actual uh, Minister of Justice, he's, um, he was the judge of this operation back then, and he used to exchange message with the prosecution, which shows that it has this, this political act behind that against the workers' body, and especially Lula, our former president. So, like, Intercept leaked these messages and did several articles, really well-written articles and well-investigated. And then, like, uh, a website did, like, this <laughs> ridiculous article saying, like, uh, Green, Glenn Greenwald operates on the dark net. Like, be careful, because Intercept receives, actually, illegal documents on dark net, which is something that whistleblowing is something really common, and every media, decent me, uh, news outlet, including Vice, have this channel on Darknet, so you can send encrypted files to whistleblowing. And I did an article explaining, like, this guy that wrote about the deep web, he doesn't know nothing about the deep web. And, like, so I explained, basically, how it works, how it's easy, really easy to get in, and you just need, you know, to know the right tools, and it kind of became viral, and that's it about Brazil. Like, people don't know a lot about how it works things, so just by explaining this, giving yeah. this kind of information that this training gave me, for example, it helps them to know, you know, about uh, finding this misinformation and knowing what they can do. Yeah, and I guess that's a, a very sort of practical example as to how you not just passing that on to, to journalists, but educating uh, the, yeah. your audience um, as well. I guess I just want to know what your guys' highlights were. I mean, a lot of, I don't know if for a lot of you guys have you've been to Berlin before, but here you are in the German capital. You land at, I'm assuming, Tegel. Maybe a lot of um, perceptions about Germany were already compromised by then. Um, and then, you know, you start this program, and I just wondered, you know, just what were some of the highlights for you? Um, what did you expect coming in and, and how it will work out? Maybe we'll kick off with, with you, John. Uh, I have already been to Berlin like three times, but only for five days each time. Uh, so I, I already like the city very much. Um, I guess what, what like the thing I remember the most is just the people you meet here. Like uh, obviously, the, so, sometimes it's weird. Sometimes it feels like we're all just one person fighting the same force. You know, whether it's literally like uh, Brazil, Pakistan, Zimbabwe, Lebanon, like the four corners of the world. But every story sounds so similar. Like, and yesterday we heard stories from Nigeria and India, as Bart said. They're, they're so similar and that, I can't explain how, how empowering that is, you know, to go back home and know that you're not alone, you know. This is a fight that everyone is fighting everywhere. And there are people who are willing to help, you know, there's, there's a whole office in Berlin that's just waiting for you to call. And that, really, and, and that's that, that, that's so empowering. Really, that's so empowering. Who, who picks up the phone when you call? Is, is, is it Benjamin who is? Who is that uh, I, I usually call Sydney. <laughs> <laughs> or or Elias. Yeah. On they're, Sunday, they're, they're the people I bother the most. Right. Uh, but uh, yeah, but also like, you know, we had the summer in Berlin, so that is an unforgettable experience. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really. A good Berlin summer. It'll it'll bring you back, and then. <laughs> Sophia. So for me, it was really my very first time to come to Berlin. And I would say 
I felt very empowered uh, meeting the RSF team, meeting colleagues from all over the world, and just like what you say, to say, mm -hmm. hearing um, that the journalist story, you know, is very much the same, whether it's Asia, whether it's Africa, I really felt inspired. And I also, one of the key takeaways that I had was the linkages that I created here, the connection that I created with my colleagues and also with the RSF team. I felt very empowered even when I went back home to say, you know what, I have connections. <laughs> Sorry, I did call Benjamin, I just remembered. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> my friend's phone got stolen and I was like, Benjamin, how do we do <laughs> There's no, I bought it no more. <laughs> and then? Yeah, so you talked about highlights and landing in Teagle. So what was clearly not highlight was Teagle Airport itself. <laughs> so like I come from uh, Quetta in Pakistan, a small town, and our airport is even better than Teagle. So, <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, speaking about good experience in Berlin, like there is a lot of good in Berlin, and not only that, just Teagle is just a minor negative point. But apart from that, there's a, like I, I am very much interested in history, and there's a lot of history that Berlin has to offer, especially about the 20th century. And uh, since I was interested in like, I was here for four months, so I just visited all the museums and the nearby concentration camps and everything related to World War II. So it was like really enriching experience for me. Secondly, the, the culture, the environment in Berlin, like there are people from all different parts of the world and you can get to meet them, you can get to know them and all this, the, the other liberal culture, that was also something that was really that I soaked up during my period and apart from that the, the, the political system and the culture and everything so apart from learning the, the technical details about digital security I also learned these things which was also really nice experience and then I also got a chance to meet some good people really good people who were like my really good friends not only my fellows but also the those people who were like supervising our program so I think it, it was a it was a really good experience and uh, as John mentioned, we were lucky to be here in the summer, so we do not regret coming here. And uh, I really uh, like the fellows who are current, uh, like who are doing their course now, I think they could not enjoy the Berlin as we did, so I think we were really lucky in that sense as well. Uh, so I was a teenage anarchist and a David Bowie fan, so obviously Berlin is, used to be my dream. And I've never been to Europe before, I came here last year. And I got here on the winter, which people say is depressing, but for me it was like, oh my god, I got to go home and visit. <laughs> so it was really a, kind of a, a dream came true to me, and just knowing that I was here because of my work was something really, really good, you know? It has a good feeling, and the people that, like the other scholars that was on the first round, which was kind of an experimental round because they're still like testing the waters, seeing the, what they can do. And we had a really good connection. Like I still talk to this day to Zuhua, she's from Georgia, she, she's not here uh, right now, she's from Egypt. Uh, Hamad from Madamaza, the, sometimes I, I talk to him also. And Tumor and Elias are amazing persons. And uh, I think all the connections and the friends I made was really, really good for me. And it made me feel really hopeful about what I can do about my profession, what journalists can do, you know? Like, I didn't have this, this feeling before. And also, we can smoke inside bars. This is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. You should come to Beirut. <laughs> you can only smoke inside bars. Oh. <laughs> okay, let me just get a sense of, does, does anybody have any questions? Um, I just want to see, just show by raising your hands, um, if you have any questions at the moment, or can we just keep chatting over here? Does somebody have a question? Okay, oh, there is actually a question. Let's take that. For the moment. Oh, okay, I will then read this question which came by our um, current fellow, Julia Lipala. So she will wants to ask actually John, um, do you think that Megaphon and or, or like online activism in general inspired the revolution in Lebanon? And personally, um, where do you draw the line as journalist and as a revolutionist or activist? I don't. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a question I think about a lot, like, 
revolutionary or journalist or activist. Uh, I mean, why can't we be all three, you know? Uh, th these are two questions, so I'll answer the first one. And uh, I want to remember, I, I want to recall what my, uh, one of the, fo uh, the, the fourth fellow, we were five, she was Marie, her name was Marien, she was from uh, Armenia. And they had the Velvet Revolution in Armenia, so uh, uh, she was telling us about it. And I remember one time we were having dinner in Bonn, a visit to Bonn, and uh, I was saying, oh, you know, that's never going to happen in Lebanon. Like, uh, the, that's just, it's a very different structure. We're not, we're not going to have that kind of revolution. And Marine was like, this is to answer your question, did we cause the revolution? Uh, Marine was like, listen, you think it doesn't happen, and one day it will happen, and it will surprise you, and you will see the people on the streets saying things that you've been writing for years, and you thought no one was listening, and you will hear them say them. And that's, that doesn't mean you caused it, but it means, you know, you created the foundation for you helped create the foundation for these things. Mm -hmm. I mean, this has been set, being, it has been in the works for hundreds of like years and like decades. You know, my parents helped it. And uh, truth be told, you know, October 17, I was standing there in Beirut. It was literally in flames. You know, people were breaking things. They were chanting things that I never thought I would hear in Beirut. Uh, it was it was a surreal experience. I I literally pinched myself. Like I was like, is this happening? Uh, and all I could think of in that moment. Really, all I could think of was Marine sitting in front of me in that restaurant and saying this line. And I, the next day, I even texted her. I was like, it's, it's, in, it's incredible. Like, what you said literally happened. And we heard people saying the things we were saying. So obviously, look at how passionate I am about all this. Clearly, I am pro-revolution, you know? Uh, and I'm also a journalist. And this is a revolution against oppression. And with, if there's oppression, there is no journalism. So I feel like... Uh, there is a way to maintain, uh, you know, professionalism and reliability and news coverage while still uh, fighting for the things that, for the values that make our work possible, which are values of freedom and, uh, you know, dignity and uh, an independent judiciary and a good economy. You know, these are things that even journalists want, and there's no shame in saying this doesn't make us less, uh, you know, reliable. <laughs> Any other questions? While you guys are having to think up, I guess I'll have Mahi answer the same question. I think it came up in your, in your presentation as well. Um, you were also in a similar sort of position. Did you, did you get the question as was? And if you can maybe answer that from uh, your I'm sorry, what was the question again? Something, sorry. So just basically about, you know, the activism and, and the journalism. Can you be both? Yeah. Should you be both? Or? This is something that uh, somebody asked me something uh, similar uh, during my presentation. And I don't know, because last year I would say that maybe it's better to separate activism and journalism, uh, journalism but uh, journalists that are activists in Brazil, they are really important because they are the ones that are reporting, for example, indigenous people uh, genocide, uh, black people, Afro-Brazilian people, uh, Afro-Brazilian genocide, for example. And I, do, I, I think they do a, a perfect job, you know? And now, I mean, if you if you believe in freedom of uh, the uh, press freedom, you're against Bolsonaro somehow. Like it's impossible. And sometimes people, I see some people from United States, for example, that they live in Brazil. They are doing like they covering Brazil politics, and they kind of say, okay, like there's Bolsonaro, but this this other part, the, the other part of this polarization, that is so extremist as Bolsonaro, which I think is a big mistake. You know, because the, the the ones who are against Bolsonaro, they are against, they are on the side of democracy. We just want the institutions to work. We just want freedom of press, and we don't want this authoritarian uh, government because we had that before. Actually, the whole story of Brazil, 500 years of Brazil, it was really authoritarian. We have a military dictatorship for like 30 years, which was awful, and now we we just have like. 30 years of democracy, and we're kind of on the edge of this happening again. So, I mean, so if you want to call me an activist because I criticize the government, because I believe in freedom of the press, so be it. Like, I actually believe this. I don't know if I answered this. I, I think you did. Um, the lady is satisfied. Um, I guess what I want to know, I mean, we have to come to a close really soon, but. Um, this program, we hope, will continue in the future that many other people can
can get this, this training. And um, maybe I'll come to you, Sophia. If you were advising somebody who is planning on taking up this course, what, what, what would your advice be to the journalist? Um, some very practical advice as they may be prepared to take this course. I would advise the journalists um, to apply for a course, mostly because of its content. Um, the exposure that you get after attending this course is on point and the relevance the course is very relevant, especially um, for journalists in um, being able to circumvent the threats that they face in their daily lives. And my advice would also be that, you know, when you do come for the training workshop, it is such that it's um, made in a, in a way that you know one comes out um, empowered in a very big way and they will know um, how to address some of the daily challenges that they face in their work one thing just i just want to add uh, i mean for journalists that want to apply to this program apply it because i almost didn't because i thought my threats weren't as, as dangerous i thought there's other countries that are in worse situation and i almost didn't apply so do it it's important if you're facing online threats or any threats whatsoever like just go and apply it because it will be important to you just uh, get some credit about your job and then what, what, about what you're doing sorry no it's all right. yeah. i think my advice will also be the same the world is getting more and more digital and everything, we are shifting more and more, so uh, we are relying more and more on digital communication, so we need to secure ourselves. And secondly, one thing is that uh, a journalist who is applying should never think that they already know enough. You never know enough about digital security. Because I, before coming to this program, I have also done some basic level coding of web designing, and I also taken like few one, <coughs> one, one, two day digital security trainings, and I thought that like, I know a lot of things about digital security, but when I came to this course and I started learning, I saw there were elementary things that I did not know about. So you never know enough about digital security and it's always good to apply for this sort of program which is like four months long, so you can go into very basics and very details and you, you learn a lot about it. And secondly, the way this uh, program is designed that not only you, you get to know a basic idea of what digital security is, but you can also develop your own digital secu security plan and strategy. <coughs> because we start with what is, what is called a threat modeling. So every journalist like has digital security threats of different nature. For example, John threats are different as compared to mine. A journalist is facing threat threat from government, other one is from a political party, and a journalist is facing a threat just from a fellow journalist who is just jealous. So in everybody's case, uh, like there has to be a, we first, but in this course what we do is that we learn how to develop a threat model, and based on that threat model, we learn how to protect ourselves digitally. So I think it's going to be really helpful for all those journalists in who can, we should apply for it when the applications open next time. Right, right. Okay, so I'm just looking around the audience. Uh, are there any questions? Oh, there is a question uh, for the gentleman. Um, so maybe uh, all of you could quickly weigh into this um, question. Um, so this um, program, as I understand, also um, had another part of it, uh, or a purpose, one might say. So all of you work in uh, spaces or, or countries where you know it's super also stressful for mental health. You know, it's not easy doing your job in that part of the world. So uh, what's your experience been like to sort of just unwind for these three, four months and take a break from your regular stressful job? If you could uh, briefly uh, uh, talk about that, like how important is it for a journalist working in conditions that all of you are, uh, are working? So let's start with John. Oh. I mean, at the risk of uh, exaggerating, <laughs> but, but, but it's real, like, I think, uh, I, I used to have anxiety problems before I came here, and uh, I, I think something snapped a, a week before I came, I went back, like, the, the simplest example is I was afraid of flying, like, I had to take pills to come here, and this was a really big problem in my life, and uh, I, when I went back to Beirut, even though I was really anxious about going back, uh, I remember I got on a plane, I forgot to take the pills, and then I was like, well, maybe I'm not afraid of flying anymore, and that's that's 100% true, you know, since then, I've traveled like a few times and I've, my fear of flying kind of just vanished. 
And uh, I, f I feel like being in an environment where you're oppressed, you don't notice that you're oppressed. That's the thing. You don't notice it unless you go somewhere where you're not oppressed and you spend a few weeks, a few months. You realize that, oh, I can answer this question and it's fine. Uh, and again, Lebanon is way better off than other countries. But uh, it's been invaluable for me. Life changing, I would say. <laughs> so for me, coming here for the four months, you can imagine the, you know, the relaxation. Um, I got away from work. I got away from the family. My family, I'm a mother. So all the hassle of having to worry, to juggle between work, family, home. It was totally amazing for me because not only was I learning, but I also get got time to unwind, you know, refocus, identify myself professionally to say this is where I want to be. And it's, you know, the four months just took all the pressure from me. And the, the day I flew back home, um, you know, I felt like, oh my God, is this really me? I could feel very light. I could feel, I felt very happy. Even my output, my, um, my output at work, when I went back to work, it was super amazing that the boss actually said, oh no, you need this more often. <laughs> Uh, thank you again for asking a very good question and uh, allowing us to speak about this topic. Yeah, it, it was like a really good change of routine for me as well. Like, went back home, like my routine is like really, really chaotic. So I wake up late and sleep late and everything. Here it was really nice because of this and so we, I had a sort of a discipline in life and uh, so th that was really good. And uh, secondly, uh, because because of social media, WhatsApp and Twitter, my mind was like, uh, could not be disconnected completely from home. So like what was happening in Pakistan, politically, socially, so still I was like thinking about it and I was following it. So, <coughs> so in that sense, I could not like separate myself completely from it. So th that's one point. And uh, in terms of having like, it was really good. We had relaxing times and I also did an experiment. Like I traveled a lot uh, in this period and uh, that was also really, <laughs> as you know, very r refreshing. And secondly, uh, when I came here, I uh, tried to learn cooking. And uh, uh, during the like, four months, like I was able to uh, like cook like a dozen different varieties of rice only. <laughs> and uh, because now I'm back home for like three months, so I've forgotten everything again. But, but that was a really good experience to answer your question. <laughs> I remember when I got here, I spent the first two weeks without taking my phone off on the street because I was afraid of getting robbed. <laughs> because, it, I mean, in Sao Paulo, if you walk on the street with your smartphone in your hand, some, somebody will come and just take it off your hand and you won't even notice because it's super quick. So I remember like I was walking, uh, I think it was kind of 11 p.m. I was at Kreuzberg going back to my flat and then I was like super scary with my phone, like in my jacket, thinking, oh my God, I'll, I'll die, I'll die, I'll die. <laughs> and then I just saw like a woman walking like with a baby wheel, I don't know. And well, she just was walking with her baby and like holding her phone, like talking to someone, like doing like this uh, live. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so Brazil, like living in Brazil is super tense. Like you are in a constant tension Bia knows about this, Anna too. Like you're constantly tense because like you don't know what's gonna happen. But so for me, like this was quite a shock for me. So I spent like I I realized how much tense I were and I could relax a little bit more. But at the same time, the elections in Brazil were happening when I was here, and it was the first time in my life that I didn't vote. And it was exactly the elections of Bolsonaro. <laughs> uh, I, I remember that when he got elected, I was, I, I don't know, I, I almost collapsed. Because I was with my Brazilian friends. I remember that I got a little bit drunk that day. Um, but I mean, I still, I remember that like, I, was, I was here at, in Germany and I could see the bigger picture and think about, okay, what should I do when I come back to Brazil? So this exactly like made me think about it and made me a little bit more relaxed. 
Of course, when I came back to Brazil, all the stress came back again. And I, I'm pissed every day in Brazil, but <laughs> yeah, that's why it's important to be here. You know? Okay, we have one more. Right. Actually, it's not a question, it's just to add a, a, a comment about uh, being here, because I think that one of the most important things of the program, the program is that it's not going to help only us as journalists, because uh, we are part of the actual group now, that it is the project that we have to de develop when we come back to our country. So we've been talking a lot about this during the last week, that we think that uh, being here is not in, uh, is going to be important for our colleagues as well once we come back to 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 our countries. Before I came in, many people were asking, "Oh, but you're leaving the country right now because of a member of a civil society organization? We are super active in defending freedom of expression in Brazil right now." And I said, "Well, it's going to be difficult to be out of the country for four months, but." Everybody said, you have to go and you have to learn and when you come back, you're gonna share all of this with us and it's gonna be super important for us. So it's not only one uh, a thing that we're gonna do for ourselves, that the, the reporters and our brothers are um, helping us directly, but it's something that is gonna help many other journalists and colleagues when we come back. So I think that is, it's important to mention as well. Thank you guys. Um, you guys are incredible. Uh, from one journalist to others, really, uh, your work is Incredible, and we'll be looking and watching your space. And also, a massive thank you to Reporters Without Borders for this incredible program. Stay with us. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.